Good morning, and uh, welcome to the Brattleboro Literary Festival 2020. Um, I am honored to be here today with two great writers who I'm going to be introducing, Mary Morris and Alden Jones. And um, before we get started, I uh, just want to say that those of you who are attending, um, you have the Q&A function. And this is uh, such an interesting duo that I really hope that you will uh, write your questions in the Q&A chat function that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And then we'll come back with about 10 minutes left in the program to, to ask some of these questions. So anyway, uh, let me go straight to the introductions. Um, uh, Mary Morris is the author of numerous works of fiction, including the novels The Jazz Palace, A Mother's Love, and House Arrest. She is also the author of nonfiction books, including the travel memoir, classic, Nothing to Declare, Memoirs of a Woman Traveling Alone, and her new book, which she'll be talking about today, All the Way to the Tigers. Uh, Mary is the recipient of the Rome Prize in Literature and the 2016 Annisfield Wolf Award for Fiction, and she lives in Brooklyn. Uh, and just a, a quick quote from O, o Oprah Magazine picked th this book up and, and said uh, about All the Way to the Tigers, this lush story tells the tale of a single woman on the road looking for redemption and healing. Expect the unexpected in her rich philosophies, inner discoveries, and self-realizations on the road. And our, our other panelist today is Alden Jones. Uh, her first book, The Blind Masseuse, a, Traveler, a Traveler's Memoir from Costa Rica to Cambodia, was named a top 10 travel book by Publishers Weekly and the Huff Huffington Post, uh, won the Independent Publishers Book Award in Travel Essays, and was long listed for the penned Diamondstein Spielvogel Award. Alden's story collection, Unaccompanied Minors, won the New American Fiction Prize, the Lasco Book Prize, and an Independent Publisher Book Award in Short Fiction, and was a finalist for the Edmund White Award in Debut Fiction and the Lambda Literary Award. Alden teaches creative writing and cultural studies at Emerson in Boston and is a core uh, faculty member of the Newport MFA um, at Salvo Regina University. Her critical memoir, The Wanting Was a Wilderness, was published in May of 2020. It is a special honor for me to be introducing Alden, who is a colleague of mine in the Newport MFA and also a very good friend. So uh, you are very lucky to have these two writers with you and I am going to bow out and don't forget to ask your questions and we will see you later. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. So I, I was told we were supposed to flash our books before, so Mary doesn't have hers and so I'm flashing both of them. You can see mine is much smaller than Mary's. <laughs> Uh, this is well. <laughs> uh, The Wanting Was a Wilderness, my new book, and Mary's new book, All the Way to the Tigers. And I hope you don't mind if I start, Mary, by just saying, um, when I was looking at what people had written about All the Way to the Tigers, someone had, someone in a review had written, um, you know, this is a, you know, a brilliant memoir of a woman traveling in the tradition of Cheryl Strayed, who's obviously very dear to my heart because this is a book about, um, you know, essentially started as a book about Wild um, and Elizabeth Gilbert. And I just laugh, I like burst out laughing because I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> they are writing, Elizabeth Gilbert and Cheryl Strayed are writing in the tradition that Mary Morris really launched because, and I have, um, where did I put it? Oh, right here. I happen to have a first edition of Mary's um, memoir, Nothing to Declare, and it's a memoir of a woman traveling alone, which was published in, it was 88, is that right, Mary? Uh, yes, it was published in 88. And... So I discovered it in the 90s, and it was really the only travel memoir that was about the journey, like not the, I'm here to inform you, but like what, it, what it's like to be a woman traveling alone. Right. Um, that had ever been written. So to me, that was like the, the gold standard of, of a travelogue written by a woman about being a woman traveling through the world. So um, I'm honored to be here with you today, Mary. Thank you for that, Alden. If I can just give a little footnote to that. Um, I, I think I told you this yesterday in 1986, I was having lunch with my editor and I was really stuck. And um, the New York Times had just published their summer travel issue and it was 27 books by men. And I was just complaining to my editor and I just said, you know, why don't women write about travel? 
And she said, well, Mary, you're gone all the time. You're going all around the world. And why don't you write about travel? And it was a real awakening moment for me because I thought to myself, why don't I? And then, you know, I read some of the books that were reviewed and I got to familiar, familiarize myself with the canon. And I realized that women move through the world differently than men. My, I, I had to own my own experiences and feel like it was okay to write about them and put myself on the page, you know, um, the way you have done in your travel writing and the way, you know, Cheryl Strait obviously did. But, you know, it was a conscious decision of, of mine that the inner journey that I was taking as a person, as a woman, had to connect to the outer journey of the landscape I was moving through. And yeah, you're right. I mean, especially not only is it so different to travel through the world as a woman, but as a woman alone is its own particular because people in, you know, different patriarchal cultures look at you in a certain way. Like, and mostly it's a question like, what are you doing here? And it's, it's interesting to see in All the Way to the Tigers that that continues, like no matter how old you are, no matter how accomplished you are, um, you know, throughout your life as a, as a woman traveling by herself, you'll get questioned, like, what are you doing? All right. There's an anecdote I love, um, about Mary Kingsley, who was one of the lady travelers of the 19th century. And she would, whenever uh, someone would ask her where her husband, I think she always wore a wedding ring when she traveled. And she would always point to the next village and she'd say, my husband is waiting for me <laughs> in the next village. And it would ensure her safe travel to that village. You know, and we've all done the equivalent of wearing a wedding ring and saying, oh, you know, so-and-so is going to pick me up in, you know, in a little mm -hmm. bit. You know, we've all found our ways to maneuver in and out of situations that men probably don't have to maneuver in and out of so much. So, right. Yeah. Well, I have to say, especially in the time of COVID, um, I just finished All the Way to the Tigers yesterday. Yes. And um, I hadn't felt that, like, er like I've, I have, I got married uh, had late and I had kids, I have three kids who are now five, seven, and nine. And I haven't like traveled, traveled in a really long time. Right. Um, but COVID, you know, it sort of made, made everyone start to think about, oh, oh, you can't just, you know, hop on a plane when you have a few days even. Um, but I haven't felt that like deep gut, like I need to travel feeling until I read all the way to the tigers. And I was like, Oh, like this really, it really captures the travel experience. And one thing I wanted to ask you about it was, um, you know, so many times when, you know, you're, if you're taking a class in travel writing, if you're writing travel writing, um, a couple things I want to talk to you about. One is chronology, like how you choose because all the way to the tigers is not told in chronological order. It's got like, um, three separate timelines and you you move right. back and forth between childhood um, going to find the tiger um, in 2011 and then a ice skating accident that got even worse and um, made it you know impossible for you to walk in right before that in 2008 right. um, so how do we choose the chronology but also how do we choose the you know what we leave in to the story and what we leave out because I tend to think like, Oh, leave out the details about getting the visa and just plop you in the middle of the adventure. Um, but I really loved reading about every, like the sort of travelogue style of every single step that you took to get to India. And that was what actually made me feel like I was really traveling with you was going through all that, all the sort of in-between moments that um, we often leave out of travel writing when it's in an essay form. Well, let, let's talk about chronology first, because I think it's really interesting and also helpful to fellow memoirists um, or people who are contemplating a travel memoir. First of all, both Nothing to Declare and All the Way to the Tigers, I wrote in straight chronological order when I first wrote it. So All the Way to the Tigers actually began with my accident um, and then went through four separate journeys that I took. And India was the last one, and it was 420 pages long, and <clears throat> it just didn't work, you know. And there was a certain moment, I tried to sell it, I couldn't sell it, let's be honest, you know, like even my own publisher didn't want it, and I was like, okay, there's, you know, there's something wrong. And the problem, actually, Alden, was chronology, and I certainly want you to talk about chronology, too, given, you know, the wanting is a was a wilderness. But I, I realized, and this I like to say, because no one will ever figure it out unless I tell you, I wanted the book to be a tiger at a certain point. So I wanted an even number of chapters. I wanted it to be compressed. Um, I wanted 
those small little chapters to be like the stripes of the tiger. And then mm. as I was writing it, first of all, I didn't be, I began with India rather late in the process of writing it, but I pulled that part forward. And so a lot of it was restructuring. Um, and one kind of little secret that I use is I print different time frames on different colored paper. Hmm. So for example, my accident that happened in the winter was all white and everything about the tiger was printed on yellow paper and childhood was blue and the tiger, other stuff was green. And then I would move it around until I had like a patchwork that really worked visually as because there were so many moving parts, you know, and I think if you've got a complicated chronology, it helps to have some technique that that works and same with nothing to declare. I wrote it chronologically and then I realized that San Miguel was really important and then I started to see it as a wheel mm -hmm. and I felt that you had to keep coming back to it. So everything in all my travel books happened, but it didn't necessarily happen in the order and right. You know. Yeah, uh, I I never tried anything like that, and I actually don't even have a printer anymore. Um, oh it's like God. I know, and it's really bad now that I can't use my my office printer. But um, when I I'd never tried this with a previous book, but with The Wanting Was a Wilderness, I did when I started writing. I was like, I don't really know what my ultimate message is with this book. I don't know what I have to say. It ultimately became a book about, you know, the real question that I had was okay, I've done an 85 day wilderness journey. And I always thought I did it, you know, when I was 19, a while ago. And I always thought that it would be too difficult to transform into memoir, because how can you make someone care about hiking, which is like walking, stepping, you know, one foot in front of the other. Um, so my real question was, how did Cheryl Strait do it? Like, how did she turn um, a hiking story into such a powerful memoir that so many people could relate to. And <clears throat> so before I got there, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I have this assignment. Basically, The Watching Was a Wilderness is a part of a series. You can see there's, this is what I love about Zoom. You can just reach over to your bookshelf. Um, there's a, it's a series of pocket books, each one about a different book. This one is about um, Jeffrey Eugenides, Middlesex. Um, and so I had this assignment to write about Wild, but I didn't really know what I was going to say. So I, so I took all these ideas I had in terms of subject matter, like a woman traveling alone, um, the, the way you can transform your life by being in the wild. And I, and I did this thing that people tell me all the time that they've done, which is I printed it out and then I cut it up and I arranged it all over the floor and then arranged all the pieces like, okay, this should follow that. And I left it there until one of my kids just, you know, sort of like rolled all over it. Um, but uh, it was very helpful. I, and it still didn't help me figure out what my book was about, though. So I had to write that part. And so I wrote the first half. And then I stepped away from the book for a really long time and um, figured it out. And only in knowing where it was going to end or about where it was going to end did it help me figure out the structure. So chronology, I don't know, like... Um, in terms of your, your second question, though, about what to leave in and what to take What's out, a, right. at what point did you decide to put in your own personal crisis? Um, you know, there are things that you layer in there quite beautifully that I, I had the feeling you didn't set out to, to be writing about that necessarily, but I may be totally wrong about that. No, I, no, you're right. And I'd love to hear what you have to say about that as well, because I think with any, when you're writing a memoir, you know certain episodes that you're going to include. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the writing, writing of it and you're like, oh, I really don't want to talk about that part of my life, but I right. think I really have to. Mm -hmm. um, like in order to explain why I left college abruptly and like spent 85 days in the wilderness, I had to explain what I was going through before that. And in order to understand what I was going through right before that, I had to back up to like high school and that was the hardest part to write. And I wrote it kind of last. I was like, this doesn't, people aren't going to understand why I felt the way I did at college unless they understand who I was as a teenager. And I think that's, that's kind of what happened with Cheryl Strait. She thought she was just going to write about a hike, but then she realized the real story was about losing her mother and falling apart. Right. And that the hike was sort of the aftermath of that. Um, so even though it's, it creates the spine of the story, um, 
it's not the the heart of the story. Yes. I mean, I think if she hadn't given us, I mean, the only other book that I've ever read about a hike that I loved was uh, Bill Bryson's A Walk in the Woods. Yes. Yeah, the that's a great one. I mean, that's just like one of the funniest books I've ever read. It's, it's he's like amazing. He's a stand-up comedian for eight hours. Yeah. Um, but in terms of Cheryl, and I think, you know, you, you hit on it, what, if she hadn't begun that, if it hadn't in the end become about her mother, and I want to tell you something that an editor said to me once about another book of mine, if it hadn't become about her mother, her issues, her addiction, her sexual falling apart, all of that, it would have just been, a, 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 you know, you know, just some dumb person who doesn't know how to take a hike you know, buying too many things and falling over in their backpack. Right. <laughs> because of her vulnerability that she puts out mm -hmm. there, the honesty of it, that is what, is what compels us. And I remember reading The Snow Leopard by um, mm -hmm. Peter Matheson. Mm -hmm. And it's a gorgeous book and everyone loves the book. But in the first couple pages of the book, he says that his wife had just died of cancer and he's leaving his four children while he goes for a, a four- months long hike in the in the Himalayas and I, I didn't blame is not the right word word I mean he did leave his four children to go on this expedition I understand that but he never comes back to them in the book mm -hmm. and that's what I felt more like why mention it if you're going to mention it follow it through part yeah of your, part of your material and I, I want to tell you something that an, a, a dear editor of mine a George Hodgman who passed away sadly about a year or two years ago um, he uh, gave, I, I had a contract to do a book about the Mississippi River and George had grown up near the Mississippi and he loved it. And the two weeks before I was to leave, Katrina happened. And basically I got to the Mississippi River and I, um, I was on the river with these two river rats named Tom and Jerry. And it was, but the, the river was, uh, had stopped because the Port of New Orleans was closed. Mm -hmm. So there were barges backed up all along the river and I couldn't get very far, you know, on the river. And I called George and I said, I don't know what to do. I can't get down to New Orleans. I'm supposed to do this whole river and blah, 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 blah. And he said to me, I don't give a flying fatuity about the locks and dams. Tell me about your father. Because my father lived in Hannibal, Missouri. And that opened it up for me. Mm -hmm. Until he said, tell me about your father. Don't worry about the mechanics of the locks and dams. And I think that's what we're talking about is that, you know, how much of our, you know, I mean, we're women, we're, we're travel writers. There's actually something someone told me once called the Mary Morris problem in travel literature, which is people who put too much of themselves on the page and it's a problem. Hmm. To me, it's not a problem. To me, it enables me to connect to you when I'm mm -hmm. reading about your outward bound experience or, or your, you know, your marriage or, you know, things that have happened to you along the way <clears throat> or hearing Cheryl's story, you know, that's what connects me to the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that idea of Vivian Gornick's um, persona, the, without the persona, there's no way to connect to the story. So no, no matter how interesting it is, you can't like, and that, that's something I find with my travel writing students quite a lot is um, this reluctance to put yourself in the story because you feel like it's not important right like it's about no this is about mexico it's not about me um but without having the the character to connect to like a constructed character to connect to then we're not gonna care about mexico right so right. um but i think that comes that comes back to the question of what we put in and what we leave out it's it's really about the balance if it's a right. travel if it's a travel work you want it to be about something specific about travel. So it's not, you know, like it's not your life story. It's not your family story. It's something personal that connects you to the place so that you can illuminate the reader on something about the place through who you are. Right. And we don't write about every place we go to. I mean, I don't set out going, oh, I'm going to write this book about tigers or I'm going to, you know, I, I rarely do that actually. Um, I, the only, actually the only case was the Mississippi River where I did have a contract. But I think you know, to, to me, you have to fall in love with the journey and it has to speak to you. And in some cases, as for you with Outward Bound or Cheryl with a, a Walk in the Woods and even with Nothing to Declare, sometimes years go by before we mine that material. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think we take experience and translate it. You know, we're not journalists in that sense. 
Right. Well, yes, it definitely, I couldn't, the, the wanting was a wilderness was a really interesting study in writing close to an event versus far away from it because I had gone on um, this hour bound course when I was 19 and it was, you know, I'd taken so many notes. I'd written like 200 pages in my journal while I was, you know, on this really intense um, physical experience. And it was the, the, <laughs> the thing when people ask me like what the hardest thing was, I was like, uh, try being with 13 other people for 85 days with no escape. Like you, all you can do to separate yourself is like go to the bathroom. That is the only time you have any privacy and, um, you know, no cell phones, no, no way to communicate with people other than your, so that was the challenge for me was this really intense group dynamic. And there was so much drama and it was so interesting to me at the time and afterwards. And I, I did write about it kind of soon after in fiction in my in my collection of stories unaccompanied minors the last story is um sort of a fictionalized version of what we what we did and how like some of the uh, drama that was happening but um i was very uncharitable to us like i was really mining us like for our all of our flaws and exaggerating them and um not showing any of the stuff that I was proud of or the way that we loved each other or, you know, the, the triumphs and the, you know, the good feelings, because it felt like it would be too cheesy to try to do that. Right. Um, especially in nonfiction. So right. I held onto it for a really long time. And when this project came to me from fiction advocate, I was like, okay, it's time. It's time for me to, to figure mm -hmm. this out. But at the same time, I, you know, I wrote a bunch of stuff about my hour bound trip and uh, about wild and then I suddenly my marriage ended out of nowhere what it felt like to me out of nowhere and I had to put the book down for a couple of years so I could like deal with my life but then when I, I was thinking about it that whole time and when I came back to it I it was a totally different book so even just that two-year period turned my understanding of my the significance of my 85 days in the wilderness into something completely different right um which was, but they were both so far after the fact, you'd think it would be more solidified at that point, but. No, it's so interesting because, I mean, <clears throat> I, I, I had my accident in 2008. I went to India in 2011. There were several other trips before, in, in between there. Um, I wrote the first draft of this in around 2013 or 14, and I put it away for two or three years, that 420-page mm -hmm. version, because, you know, sometimes, it's sort of, at times as a writer, I feel like a moving van arrived and just dumped all this stuff in my living room. And I've got to sort through it somehow and figure out what goes where and what to keep and what to get rid of. And it just, you know, and sometimes you have to walk away from it, you know. And I, I, I have never found a pause to be a bad thing for a book you're working on. I think it's a great thing. Yeah. I, I have to say every time someone says, you know, just have, write the shitty first draft and just get it done. I'm like, no, I can't. I, like, I can't do that. I'm not. I break all the rules when it comes to drafts. I'm, I will stop if I'm like, oh, this isn't working. Instead of just continuing on, I walk away. Mm -hmm. And then I think, and then I think, and I think, and then I'm like, I think I have it. And then I go back to it. But, you know, you're supposed to just write through and fix it later. But that never has worked for me. That always takes me in the wrong direction. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, the Indian poet Tagore said, um, um, God respects you when you work, but he, he, they love you when you sing. And I love the idea of, uh, to me, if, if, if my work isn't singing, if my work feels like I'm working, like a job, like I'm working on a book right now that's very research driven and it feels like a job and I'm in a cabin in the woods and I'm going out of my mind, like kind of a little bit. And, you know, I'm thinking maybe I walk away from it now and not push to the full draft because I feel like I'm, you know, beating the work workhorse a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, yeah. It just feels like, you know, I, I know when I'm singing and I know when I'm working. That's and very I, reassuring to hear, yeah. Mary, because yeah. I always feel like I'm doing it wrong. I should like muscle through, but I know that I just don't work that way. I think sometimes you just have to put it away and, you know, trust the process. Mm -hmm. Um and come back to it with fresh eyes. You know, I, I, I try to come back to something as if I hadn't written it, you know, as if someone sent it to me and said, you know, what do you think of this? Right. And, and it's much easier to do oh, that oh. once you've had a few days away from it. So yeah. Or months <laughs> or months. Yeah. Or, or months. years. <laughs> yeah. Um, so all the way to the tigers, 
was it became to i don't want to do any spoilers but it, it became um you know i did i didn't see the way that now that you explain the way that the chapters were organized I, I hadn't caught on to that like that was the sort of construction of the the tiger but it did seem like the book's narrative was mimicking a tiger's behavior in the kind of slow like it's not about the or even looking for a tiger you like you might not see one but it's something about the journey without the the resolution you know without the it wasn't about like seeing the tiger it was about the experience of looking for the tiger right um mm -hmm. that became like what fueled the book so when you started the book did you know it was going to end with um well like i don't want to tell the end but um it was that your intention to show the the process of you know the, the journey is the destination um it was definitely my dis my plan to show that the journey is the destination but also you know when i was on tiger safari in india for several weeks uh, where i was also quite ill so it was really a tough tough time um when when i was on the tiger safari it, it became clear to me at a certain point that well one of the things you learn very quickly is you don't look for tigers you look for signs of tigers which of course as a writer is just such a beautiful metaphor for me that you don't look for the thing you look for the you know, Absolutely. indicators of the signs of the thing. Um, so you listen for how other animals in the jungle sound, for example. That's one of the alarm calls. That's one of the big tells. You look for, there, there are different, there's all different ways that the guides know how to look for a tiger. But I reached a, a moment where I realized I didn't care if I saw a tiger, that the experience I was having was perfect. And, you know, it, it's one of the things that I feel as a writer, as a, as a teacher, uh, pro it was the process, the journey, not the destination, not, not the discovery necessarily. I mean, the discovery was the journey and anything else was icing on the cake. And I think it's always, you know, I, I'm not a good person. In fact, I'm a very bad person to give an itinerary to. I will very defiantly not follow it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because I, I would love to travel with you, Mary, except for one thing, which is yeah. I'm extremely punctual and it seems like you're the opposite. <laughs> so that would be, that would be our battle. But I think otherwise we, it would be really fun to travel with you and like just. To right, but if you know, I'm going to show up, if I say I'm going to show up an hour later, like, you know, I'll meet you at such and such blah. You know, friends always say to me, I want to travel with you. And I say, no, you actually don't. <laughs> a lot of what I do is nothing. You know? And the fact is, if I, uh, you know, I do linger. It's in the very front of the travel book. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's part, part of the reason that I got myself into trouble. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think I'm much older than eight years old, basically. In my head. <laughs> well, that's you know? great. I, I actually earmarked that part of your book. Let me see if I can find it about... Um, being a writer and yep i have it right here look at that can you tell i teach literature uh, page 145 um real travelers like real writers move through the world like a child with a child's sense of wonder and surprise to move as if you've never been somewhere before even if you've been there a thousand times as if you are experiencing something for the first time this is why my husband often says to me and not always in a complimentary way uh, this is what my husband often says about me. Uh, every village we travel through, every painting we see, every meal eaten, it, it is as if I've not experienced any of this before. So yeah, that really struck me as um, something really true about both writing and, and traveling. Like, um, first of all, if you have an agenda, you're not going to experience what you experience. It is that sense of wonder and discovery that makes the journey the destination. Um, being right. if, you're, if you're looking for something else, you won't see the thing that probably you should see, you know what I mean? Like it, or not even should see. I mean, uh, yeah, exactly what, what you said. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out how you landed exactly on that page at that moment. <laughs> I just, I just earmarked it. a little weird actually about our connection right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have a book with me, so that was pretty good. Oh, good. good transition. <laughs> <laughs> um, totally shifting gears. I just have to mention that this, it could not have been more weird to you that the Tiger King came out right before this book and everyone started thinking about tigers right yeah. as this book was about to come out. No, it was crazy. And, 
you know, friends started texting me and saying, do you know about the Tiger King? Do you know about the Tiger King? And I'm like, you know, so I started watching and I was like, what the, is, what is this? This guy, this crazy. is crazy. Um, but I like to think of myself as the Tiger Queen. <laughs> and kind of, actually, my daughter said the best thing that ha has happened in 2020 is that I was in an article in the Wall Street Journal with Joe Exotic. They like wrote oh, about funny. us together. Well, I have <laughs> to say, been like. I watched the Tiger King when it came out. And I think in a lot of ways, your book did the opposite of what that show did. Um, which was put the emphasis on the tiger. And I, I think the show's producers knew uh, that if they started telling you much about tigers and how they live in the wild and how they, you know, what their behavior is like, you would have instantly been unable to watch the show because of the way the tigers were being treated. And so you didn't really learn very much about tigers. No, you don't learn anything. There's, there's a great book called The Tiger by John Valiant. It's a fantastic book of nonfiction. Um, and a, a lot of the facts I've learned about tigers are, is, is in, he, you know, a lot of it is in his book. Um, but, you know, they are solitary apex predators. A male tiger requires approximately a hundred square kilometers of territory for just itself, which is why tiger conservation in the wild is so difficult. And when you see the treatment of these tigers and when you see them as circus mm -hmm. acts and, you know, all petting zoos and all of that um yeah it's adorable and then what happens to them and right becomes a predator and animals and they, yeah you know so they really downplayed that so i was really happy to follow up with some actual knowledge on Thank tigers <laughs> yes. all of you fans out there of the tiger king you can read all the way to the tigers yep, and, for yeah for sure and um get get the real story so i will say tigers are making a pretty good comeback in the wild right now so that's, that's good great mm -hmm. Well, I definitely want to go see one now when my kids are a little older. Maybe bring them. Yeah, I'll, I can. I can tell you. Don't go where I went. I can tell okay. you. Okay. <laughs> I will definitely e email you when that time comes. January. Um, so should we take some questions or should we keep going? We could keep going. I could keep going. But are there questions? Sorry, I didn't mean to just. I didn't mean we do, to. We do have a few questions, so maybe this will help frame the discussion. This is just fascinating, you guys. I'm. I'm like totally riveted. I wish we had more time, but yeah, we do no, have a few questions. I want to make sure that we get it in. Okay. The first one is um, from Sebastian Matthews, who says, do either of you see Nancy Mayers as an influence? Not a travel writer, of course, but an early uh, pioneer in personal essay. I don't know that author. I don't know either. Nancy Mayers. Okay. Well, what is the, the name? To Nancy Mayers, M-A-I-R-S. I think you'll, maybe you'll see Sebastian later and you can, you can give him, you know, Ask him more about it. Sounds I'm not interesting. A writer. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. And then this, this other question is really interesting. Um, do either of you consider earlier writers like Emily Hahn traveling through Africa in the 1920s, Isabella Bird, or Rebecca West as inspirations? And how, and I would add maybe Beryl Markham to that list. And how do you feel those women's travel writing from so long ago are different from your own writing? Can I, I have not. Go ahead, Mary. I don't, if you don't, if you, I, I, if you don't mind, I just want to, you know, um, my husband and I actually edited an anthology called Maiden Voyages that has um, excerpts from all of those women travelers, and they were definitely an important influence um, in in my life. Rebecca West, um, her writing about the former Yugoslavia, <clears throat> um, Isabella Bird, I think Colorado, I think she traveled through. Um, you know, one of the reasons my husband and I did Maiden Voyages was because there weren't, there wasn't enough excerpted writing by women travelers. So yes, they were very important to, to me. But the thing about those travelers to remember is that those were ladies of means, as they were called, independent ladies of means. So they uh, they, they had money and they didn't have responsibility. They didn't have children. They didn't have three children, you know, so they uh, were able to go on those journeys. Um, and personally, I'm interested in a different kind of journey for myself. Um, I am too. And I think, you know, I'm one of those people, it's probably very annoying to some of my people I watch movies with. And I, I'm always like, ah, an old movie, like the roles of women in those movies are really, it's like hard for me to get past. So while I completely 
respect and admire and, and recognize that these writers paved the way for writers like me and writers like Mary, um, that it's not what I'm drawn to. It's more of an academic, like I, it's an academic interest, but um, I think the class issue is also like it's, um, you know, often accompanied by, a, you know, colonialism and things that, that bother me to read about now, like a, a pro-colonialist, you know, attitude. Um, like I, I did really enjoy Out of Africa. Um, I wrote about that one when I was, you know, thinking about the blind masseuse and, and exoticism. Um, but uh, I love, you know, I love classic literature, but when I'm thinking about what kind of stuff I want to write, it's more the stuff that hasn't been written yet. It's like mm -hmm. more working towards something, continuing the conversation rather than, um, you know, so looking back at, at, you know, that's a conversation happening on this point of the timeline, but, um, you know, I'm more interested in what can happen next and what new things can happen with travel literature. Yeah, and if I could add to that, Alden, because I think it's a great, really great answer. I, I love what you, you just said about, you know, um, kind of the, the need to find new models for women traveling new ways of talking about being on the road. And I think that that's what we're trying to do. And I, I agree that, you know, one of the thing, thing about the lady travelers is you, you literally don't know anything about them any more than you know about Paul Theroux and, you know, why he's gone all over the world. So, um, you know, yeah, I, why has I, he I gone? All over the I think we're redefining the genre. What? Why has he gone all over the world? Yeah. just Well, I have some ideas, but anyway, <laughs> Um, yeah, and I think travel writing was really kind of stuck in a rut for a long time. Like um, in the 90s, when I was first starting to, um, you know, think about travel writing, and it came to me very accidentally. Like I traveled a lot as, you know, I traveled a lot with Tim, actually. Um, and I had just come back from a year in Costa Rica, and I was getting my MFA in fiction. And I just happened upon this um, magazine that was started by Jason Wilson, who's now the editor of the series editor for Best American Travel Writing. And I was, you know, I was the person at NYU who opened the mail and I opened the mail and um, at the writing department and there was this magazine and it was the Grand Tour, the magazine of fine travel writing. And I was like, oh, I, I could write fine travel writing, I think. <laughs> so I like sat down and wrote an essay about living on a coffee farm in Costa Rica where my family, my host family was evangelical and had just converted and were like really uh, rule followers about um, what their church said. And one of the things was you can't drink coffee. And I was like, wait a minute, like that's kind of one of the reasons I was drawn to Costa Rica was the coffee, you know, and I'm living on a coffee farm with no coffee. And that, um, that wound up being much more successful than any of my fictional attempts had been to, you know, get published. It wound up in Best American Travel Writing. That's how I met uh, Jason. But um, at the time, so I was like, oh, maybe I'm going to try this genre. And there was really very little. There was Mary Morris, nothing to declare. There was, you know, actually Tim was the one who recommended Bill Bryson to me. And I remember being on the subway in New York and just laughing to the point where people were like moving away from me because I was like laughing so hard from this. Um, but otherwise it just felt like, like you just said, Mary, like we didn't learn anything about the people in the books. Like for the most part, it was like, I just felt this dry intellectual distance from most of what I was reading. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, Eat, Pray, Love gets thrown under the bus a lot, but um, that also really changed the, I mean, that was like a further step in, you know, how can you make the journey about, you know, personal discovery even more so than it is about the places you're visiting. Like you don't just read this book because you're going to Italy you read this book because you've gone through a hard time and you want to know like how things might go for you. Right. So, so yeah, I feel like we, we have evolved drastically in the past 15 years with, with travel. And I think that's because memoir has evolved. Like memoir has become much less like you have to have something crazy have happened to you or like something really uh, dark or a secret or, you know, that's how it seemed to be in the nineties. Um, and now it's like any, you can write about anything you can write about, you know, writing a book, which was kind of what The Wanting Was a Wilderness is. It's a memoir about writing a memoir. Um, but um, it's more about how you make that, like that message come clear through a personal experience. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, I, I would like to throw, I, I, is there another question, Tim? Because I want to throw something back at Alden. That, I, no, go ahead, throw, throw it back. You know, we, we, we talked a little bit, we both write fiction and we both, you know, we tell stories. Maybe we should talk for the last few minutes about why memoir? Why, why tell it as memoir? Why not have written these things as, well, you did obviously with Flea, right? I think mm -hmm. that's one of the stories where mm -hmm. you mind that and I've certainly mined aspects of this, but you know, how do we make that decision? To, what makes that decision happen for us? Yeah, that's a really, how can we do this in five minutes? I love this question. Um, but uh, like we could talk for hours about this, I think. I it's, know. It's, um, I mean, I think I tried in this case with, with my 85 day um, wilderness thing, it was, I had tried it in fiction and something didn't seem true about it. Because even when you're writing fiction, you're trying to say something true. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was like, maybe I should try it in a different mm -hmm. genre because I really want to tell the truth this time. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a different challenge for me. What do you think about your work? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I, I'm always interested in telling a story. So it's always going to be about the story. Um, and there wasn't a, a moment where I thought that All the Way to the Tigers should be fiction. It just didn't present that way to me. Um, actually, with all the travel books, none of them really felt like they should be fiction. Um, but to be honest with you, we only have like two minutes. I don't really know why that is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm thinking, for example, I, I think, I believe you mentioned it in, in your book, Catherine Harrison, who mined her relationship with her father and her fiction quite successfully, and then finally wrote um, a memoir about that relationship that was extremely powerful and difficult to read, but very successful. And I think she's stopped writing about her father in the same way. So um, I think it's uh, one of the <clears throat> Euripides plays where... Um, Odysseus shows up at the judges after he's blinded himself, if I got my mythology right. He shows up and, and he says, you know, when's, when's it going to stop hurting? And the judges say, you have to tell your story again. Mm -hmm. You have to tell your story. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, we can tell it as fiction, but sometimes we just need to tell it, you know. You got to come clean. Yeah, I think that was the case with Cheryl Strayed's Wild as well. Mm -hmm. Like, she said, you know, she joked about um, when she started writing what she thought was an essay about her hike and she turned to her husband and said, I'm so, I'm just so glad I'm not writing something about my mother, you know, like I'm just writing something about my hike. Um, but she, and she told that she'd written about her mother in essays before, um, but it was like, she had to tell it in this complete way so she could move on. Um, and I think that was true of, of Catherine Harrison with the kiss as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I think there's certain material you have to just sort of reckon with in some right. way. And maybe for some, for other people, it's fiction, but sometimes it's like, you just need to, to come clean in a truthful way, like a literally truthful way about, um, you know, something that, that, uh, has preoccupied you in order to move on from it. Right. And at the same time, kind of be, be true to a story that you want to tell. Mm -hmm right to 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 come clean and tell it tell the truth but also tell tell the story mm -hmm. um, so yeah yeah so tell the truth that's how we can we can land everyone go out and tell the truth <laughs> tell the truth that's a great way to sort of end this this really fascinating conversation thank you so much you both it's been thank really you. really thank interesting. you Thank you, everybody. Um, and great. just to everybody out there, uh, these books are both available. There's actually going to be a splash page that will show up on your screen when we're done here. But those books are both available in lots of places, but uh, at bookshop.org, which is one of the we're working with in the festival to, to sort of coordinate. So you can order them easily at bookshop.org. I highly recommend you order both of these books and read them. And um, the other thing is, uh, there's also on the splash page a way to donate to the festival. We, we love donations. It's important to keep this. This is a really great festival. It's many years in the running and, and we want to keep it going. So consider that. And secondly, just take a look at the, uh, the, the, the web page has the, the schedule for this weekend, which is just full of really interesting writers and conversations. But Alden and Mary, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to be here thank with you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Alden. So great, great to talk to you, Mary. It was great to talk to you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.